employee email service. Then uh, when in the uh, early 90s, when we came up with the web, then the web take over as a platform. Then uh, uh, in about five to ten years ago, we saw Facebook or those social networking service may take over as a platform. But it didn't go quite. Then what's happening in the last three, four years is a mobile message service is becoming a, a platform. So people build up all those applications in the uh, mobile message service. And you will only the uh, mobile message service about 70, 80 percent of your time. And uh, accessing the internet is uh, 10, 20, 30 percent. So the, here uh, we have a challenge. Can they issue the world? <laughs> the, 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 I, 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 just to tell you like two stories to really drive home this point, right? Um, China, uh, WeChat, if any of you use WeChat, so my entire organization, we probably use WeChat, we chat with each other, we have 50 folks in public markets. And he asked me, why do you guys choose WeChat over the rest of the apps? And I say, well, because it's the least likely to get shut down in China. That's why we use it. <laughs> so, we're, so we're on it. And, um, and WeChat is amazing. The thing that, uh, aside from tier one cities, you picture a, a tier two city in China, um, a, a teenage kid getting their first Xiaomi phone, and one of the deep, one of the first apps they have is WeChat because all the friends are on it. WeChat today lets any user book a taxi, reserve restaurants, um, and even invest money in a money market product, and sleep from WeChat itself. So for a lot of people, WeChat is the internet. They have their own likely social network layer on it. And, and the way the user experience comes together, it's not even clunky, it's not even messy, it's actually very elegant. So when I'm in design conferences in Silicon Valley, all I'm looking at WeChat is saying, wow, this is actually a really good product. You know, it's actually designed pretty well. How do they mash up all those services internet in one app, right? I think that's very interesting. But this is not like a China-only phenomenon that's happening. A recent tweet that has gone kind of like semi-viral around from an American uh, uh, tweet, 13-year-old boy. He had a screenshot on Twitter of, from, of, of his own iPhone, and it asked, how do I get rid of this phone app? And on the screenshot itself, Snapchat, and all these other messaging services, and then he's trying to get rid of the phone app. He doesn't even need the phone app. So for a lot of people who talk about the next chapter of the internet, we talk about uh, the future of the internet, right? We can talk about it in five year terms, 10 year terms, but if what we've seen in the past five or 10 years is that if we want to see a picture of the future of the internet, we don't, we don't need to wait five to ten years. Like the future is already happening, just in a lot of small pockets around, and it's going to happen faster and faster. I think for a lot of my experience in uh, investing in companies, is sometimes I underestimate how large these companies get, how pervasive these companies get. All of a sudden, almost overnight, there's an exponential nature to the growth of these companies and these services, and sometimes it's very hard to to predict exponential uh, growth. And we're so used to a red linear world. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so, the first one I was an interview. Could you hold the mic close to you? Sure. I heard an interview that Professor Khan gave once where he talked about how he was struck uh, by a, a he was struck by a friend who told herself about some comments that were made, and it forced, it forced him to think about the ramifications of this platform that we've created and what it actually means uh, to, to kind of be a force that drives something that can, can move the future of history so fast and, and what that what that can actually mean. And I, I guess especially when you started talking Haley about about these platforms that you're creating and how pervasive they can be um, and especially the, the surveillance mechanism like you guys are both have both created and have the power to create these amazing things that also have amazing repercussions for people's lives and people's privacy. And I guess I've asked for you to reflect particularly as your best ways of how you have thought about those type of things. Well, um, well, yeah, you know, I so I was in this museum once in Washington, DC. Uh, it's called the Museum. I was misled to go into the museum because like somebody said, hey, that could be a museum of new things. So I was interested in you know, older things. I wanted to see new stuff. I went in there and it turned out to be a museum about the news. 
right? So, <laughs> so when I saw the, then, and as I walked through the museum of years, I saw how the printing press when it was first invented as a technology was primarily used by these dupes to spread propaganda and control people who are literate. And it was a primarily started off as a control mechanism in a lot of parts of the world in its early usage. And then there was, of course, uh, people got, uh, got uh, to appreciate the power of print and started to take their own kind of a counter control, counter oppression kind of press that went around, right? So when I look at the internet and the services today, I see that it could be used for good, it could be used for evil, it could be used for all kinds of stuff. And it's almost as though the users are learning to use it themselves. We've got people who realize that they posted things you know, too publicly on Facebook, their employers learn about it, and, and now they're judged in their workplaces because of something that happened the night before. Right? All the way to what you brought up as like people committing suicide because of the social media activity that's been happening and impacting them. So I when I reflect a lot of this stuff, you know, it, it's really a reflection of what what am I, what are we investing in, what are we helping to create, and how can we help people use it more responsibly? Um, and am I stepping too far to try to teach people how they should use Facebook or, you know, or do we just let them use Facebook and let them learn on their own? I think those are all really interesting thoughts. Um, I think we wanted to add something. Let me talk on uh, this uh, messenger service in particular. Uh, okay, Asia, yes, we are living finally on a major platform. Then, uh, shall we? We we'll go ahead like this way, or do we have any problem? Is a kind of new challenge we are having. Like China has a meter, and uh, Japan has a, a line, and fiber, uh, and uh, Korea has uh, uh, cacao. Like, uh, can we collectively give the world? For example, I give one example. Uh, this is an example by the American. Had a hard time to coordinate back in about 10 years ago. Interoperability. Okay, you are using a line, okay? I'm using a WeChat. Can we exchange about a message? And uh, you want to do it. But today it doesn't work. And uh, American you know, should, uh, SNS, they had this problem about uh, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, now, it, can we do it? So the can we provide a good platform globally? And then the country is uh, uh, the right power, okay? It's the human right. Can we come up with a good product in such a way which can satisfy the uh, uh, human rights? And uh, that's the uh, challenge. And the one thing, <laughs> I'm optimistic, the reason is that if it does not satisfy the outcome, people don't choose that product. Since we have got the healthy condition in the internet, sort of get rid of the lousy uh, product. And uh, uh, that's the main to be seen. Well, the, I think the, the, the end, your, your question. Years is like the, the, these weapons are in the hands of a few. Um, so, most media broadcasting, media creation tools are just owned primarily by the powers of TV. But today, people can use apps and, and different services, messenger services, to organize with their friends. Um, so, a, a buddy of mine uh, created this app called Fire Chat. Uh, some of you may have uh, heard of Fire Chat and its role in the uh, Occupy Hong Kong the, the protests. Uh, what, <laughs> what had happened is that what Fire Chat does is that um, it connects my phone to your phone, and your phone to her phone. We have a central internet, we create like a mesh of phones that talk to each other. Yeah, mesh technology, peer to peer mesh technology. And their technology called Open Garden is really disruptive because it links iPhones to Androids so across all platforms. So if I'm going to open a fire chat chat room today, and we shut down all the internet in the Philippines because something went crazy. And and we shut out all the internet, all of us will still be able to chat with one another. 
So a lot of activists around the world have taken fire chat as the as a as a tool they can use to communicate with one another to organize themselves in, in, in places where you know internet may be shut down. But of course there was that earlier argument that will terrorists use this as well to inflict harm. So I think both of those uh, scenarios are uh, are persistent as how as, as we take steps forward and uh, us as citizens and us as you know activists and us as investors, us as governments, us as human beings have that fundamental choice, I don't know, at least the good or without choice, right? Is <laughs> that like we have to deal with some of these things which will happen. And, uh, and all of that's very exciting. More of friends go to jail as a result. Uh, but instead, in all of us have part of the We should open the floor to questions to see, to see what else you guys are interested in talking about. You know, like I'm interested in asking him more stuff as a, as a technologist and a futurist. Uh, and if you guys ever want to talk about entrepreneurship in the Philippines or in other countries, tech entrepreneurship uh, or dynamics of venture capital, I'm happy to talk about that too. This is a, the awkward moment where I call my mom up to team up, ask a question in front <laughs> Just brief. So, uh, a question about uh, platforms. Well, what's your name, buddy? Uh, so, I'm Sasha. Uh, Sasha? I'm uh, from uh, Iceland, Europe. Wow, you came all the way here. Well, welcome. Uh, and uh, I actually run a business there. Uh, nice. So, my question would be about platforms because we do look at them, right? Especially the question about human rights and uh, how do you see, especially in this region, the uh, self self policing of platforms even beyond uh, regulations that are put upon them? As we see, for instance, even with platforms that are supposed to be in the free world, like uh, 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 like Facebook. Well, I think there's a. The, uh, I think if I'm piecing out your question, you're asking about like uh, how do we see self surveillance or self censorship? As more and more people use platforms, is that the question? Yeah, but also by the platforms itself. As what oh. we see in a lot of situations is the rules imposed by platforms uh, that go further than any kind of rules that a society or a yeah. uh, company might have. Yeah, that, that's interesting. It's like Facebook saying you're not allowed to do this, right? And they invent their own rules on Facebook. And you mentioned earlier is that we had to choose to use the services or so we choose not to. And I have friends who choose not to use Facebook. They're like, okay, guys, this is my last post. I'm going to commit Facebook to sign out. Bye. Hit next bye. Oops. And then, okay, don't use Facebook forever. I think some people exercise those choices. But what I think is really complex is that I did not want to post like pictures from partying last night, but which is the meme party last night. And um, and that is just my, you know, I don't want anyone to share it. You know? So it's, it's complex because it's almost you lose the freedom to choose when you want to be photographed and shared across. It's like the world's paparazzi right now, and like anyone, it's, it's difficult to be so private. But I think the counter argument to that is that it actually helps people to be more responsible. You're less likely to act like a complete jerk last night if you know that a lot of people who photograph you to be a jerk. Um, people who get like semi famous, you know, they kind of try to be more careful about how they conduct themselves. People that send text messages, it's so easy for me, for, for anyone to send text messages to each other and have a sexual harassment in the workplace over text messages and have a screenshot immediately circulated out, resulting in people losing jobs. So I think there is an aspect to that that makes people more responsible in real life because what happens in real life may happen in Facebook. Yeah, maybe sort of help some more. Like today, the WeChat. Probably the biggest in the world, nearly one billion users. And the line is about half billion. And they are, in a sense, competing. If the WeChat cannot satisfy your requirement, okay, then the people choose the uh, line for something else. So, the, in a sense, we have a, this uh, uh, competition. It's a very healthy competition. This winner takes all. People that find the competition. Like, for example, like earlier this morning, we had a session on the messenger. And I uh, was talking about uh, uh, this line application in Thailand. 
Uh, they don't go and try to offer food that they try to control. Then somehow they made an arrangement. Okay, uh, Nine was the headquarters in, in Japan. Like a Japanese like a, a law doesn't allow the people to say that. And so it seems to be we have all those collaboration between the, the people in the user in the China and the Japanese law. So the innocent, that's something we didn't expect at all. But it seems to be we are coming up with uh, some very friendly competition. And uh, then who is going to remain is something yeah, uh, all not by in, in the five years or ten years, but no one knows today. So, who works in uh, who works as an activist uh, or uh, the human rights uh, arena in this room? Uh, well, two, 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 three people raised hand. So, the panel earlier was actually very inspiring for me because I, I think I've been stuck in this commercial market driven world for a while now, and then like I, I started. Uh, I started seeing how a lot of people have been fighting for very basic things and different laws, right? Whether it's in India, Tunisia, Egypt, and all of these. We've invested in, we've done, a, we've done 40, 48 companies, I think, in India. And if the laws of a country are not friendly for people to create businesses, to create innovation, and to attract foreign capital or local capital to go into these innovations, it's almost as though the country will be stunted from innovation for a good five, ten years. It's almost generational damage that happens. So I'll give you a story to exemplify my experience from this. So I just came in from Vietnam. I was just in Vietnam for a whole week. Um, we're talking to different people in Vietnam to try to piece together the conditions for us to invest in 50 companies. A lot of people say it's impossible. They're like, oh, but you can use it. Vietnam, uh, you know, there's nothing you want to do, you know? And like, uh, yeah, but, and the things that they told me was that there's a media humor site similar to 9gag, which is also a portfolio company based on Hong Kong. They're like a humor site, they're like a viral humor site. And we got so big in Vietnam, there are like 2 million unique visits a day, right? Very, very quickly. They were acquired by a large media company in Vietnam. One week later, the government ordered to shut down that entire uh, company because they were jokes about the government. So an entire big media business was shut down, investors lost their money, and the founders didn't have to go and, you know, it's like, I, I didn't get a chance to meet them, I don't know where they are now, but the whole business has been shut down. Now, what actually went on behind the story about that humor site in Vietnam, like, we don't know. But the repercussions of that is foreign investors will tell that story to each other. They say, hey, man, you want to invest in Vietnam? They're like, oh, I don't know, man, it was like, we got shut down the government, man. I don't care, yeah, we out of here, it's a so, so people, it's, Sometimes emotionally, not as rationally, based on a lot of these stories. So, I don't know if that one move by the government and the way they dealt with it pushed Vietnam's foreign direct investment in technology back for a couple of years. I don't want to be dramatic about it, but I dare say that it does affect people. So, the kind of work that you guys do with human rights and working to change laws to make the internet more free, more democratic, and less, um, less in interruption and interference from the government actually goes a long, long way, it's not just affecting the lives of daily people, but it affects the economy as well. So I'm inspired by what you guys do, and at first I thought rights con, I thought, should I come to rights con, should I find it, make this, you know, it doesn't seem that squarely involved in my day, you know, but now that I kind of see it, you know, I'm very glad I came, thanks, you know, for you, Rian, and a lot of people are fighting, I think this is a very inspiring group of people, actually. I, I would be very interested to hear more. Uh, so you, you talked a bit about how in Southeast Asia, like startup culture could be different from Silicon Valley. Yeah. And I would, would be very interested to hear more about how you think or in, in what way uh, that could be, what, what the kind of things uh, are already or what this might be. Well, in the case of China, it's even bigger. Then, they have a very close collaboration with Silicon Valley. Like if you go to Silicon Valley, about half of them, or more than half of them, either Chinese or Indian. So those 
collaboration within the Chinese, Indian, and Silicon Valley and their home countries. It's amazing. So the seems that's the way we are heading in the next uh, coming years. Unlike Japan or Korea, we don't have much of business in the Silicon Valley. So it's almost as if China and India are more open to all diaspora in Silicon Valley to improve more exchange, whereas Korea and Japan are more closed. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, it just happened that way. Uh, it's just, I guess it's a scandal. Must it be because they're post-colonial? Sorry. Yeah, to discourage people from asking questions, the mics are placed about a kilometer away. So you gotta spread to these mics. Must it be because they're all both incidentally post-colonial, like China has a part where it's post-colonial, and then India is post-colonial as opposed to Japan and what's the other country, Korea, where they have, I mean, where they are, where sort of like. I'll let the historian answer Yeah, so that would be an interesting point of view. If, you know, if that, that made a difference to, um, to that. Okay, I guess since it's incidental, like, you can go back all the way about 30 years ago, like a Chinese or an Indian, if they come to the USA, it's pretty difficult to go back to their countries. Because Difference in the living standards is just, just too much. And, uh, on the other hand, like uh, uh, Japan, they just have to reach the USA. So they don't, uh, they don't want to stay in the USA. And the Korea is sort of a halfway. Then I sort of uh, they build up a Chinese sort of a network, human network in Silicon Valley and combination the network between the uh, Silicon Valley and uh, uh, China. Then uh, they see the merit of this network. So they try to build up more and more. And uh, that's very powerful. So whatever happened in Silicon Valley, it's just there. There's a study, there's a study in featured in a book called The Immigrant Exodus, uh, written by Vivek Wanwa. Where uh, the data uh, shows that about, I forgot the exact number, but about 60% or 58% or something of um, technology startups founded in Silicon Valley had immigrant co founders. It'd be interesting to look at that data to see how many of them come from China and come from uh, India as opposed to Korea and Japan. I think you'll probably validate the hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, a question about the differences with uh, this dark culture and uh, West sort of culture, like I'll go around Southeast Asia or Asia and uh, Southeast Asia, they'll say that, oh, um, oh, in, uh, in the Philippines, um, there's not so much entrepreneurial culture, you know, people just want to get jobs and stuff like that. And it, or, I mean, there is that argument, but on the other hand, what you see about the economies of uh, Southeast Asian countries are that they're primarily made out of small medium enterprises. They apply to the local people, the highest percentage of GDP created by small medium enterprises. And on the streets, I remember my first visit to Manila, this was uh, when I was a teenager, I got off in a bus. And then I had a few people trying to sell me all kinds of stuff, man. This dude came up, he had a lot of feather in the desert. He's like, selling me a feather in the desert. I don't want a feather in the desert. And then somebody else came and said, oh, wow, I can charge our phone. I got this spare battery. I'm like, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was sitting on a bus, right? And five people trying to sell me stuff, man. Like to me, every Southeast Asian country you go, there are people on the streets trying to sell things. Everyone's mom and dad runs this ramen shop or something. It's like entrepreneurship as a culture is very much inherently Asian and is inherently very much in Southeast Asian countries. That being said, technology, we have to wait till we have enough smartphones around, there's enough investors around, and enough kind of brain exchange with Silicon Valley and a lot of these global ideas for now for local entrepreneurs to want to build things. So I would say that when the entrepreneurship DNA of uh, Asians um, get bitten by the technology bug and they see a lot of money to be made and opportunities to build great businesses, you're going to see a huge shift in the number of local startups being founded and, and more and more success stories coming up from these locales. So I am pretty optimistic about the, the future of that. Any other comments? Okay, why are you uh, we are waiting? Let me sort of slow in the next 
five, ten years as a uh, technical person. The first one is the uh, number of users. Today we have about uh, three billion internet users. Within ten years, we will double or even more than double. So you will be uh, in the by next decade will be uh, six to seven billion internet users. So the challenge is the how do we facilitate those uh, new internet users? And they are very likely use only smartphone. They don't use computer. Uh, probably they don't know the uh, Facebook or Google. And it's a new new breed of people. And uh, how do we facilitate those people to use uh, this facility well? Then next one is a uh, uh, Internet of Things. So far we have been talking about uh, how many people. Now we're talking about device. And uh, within 10 years, very likely it will be uh, one trillion. Uh, Devices connect to the internet. 20, 30 times of the human being. And this one, I hope in a future right term, they should address this issue. The reason is that uh, the free health for the enhance the uh, human rights or the other way around. The problem I anticipate is that. Uh, when you have one trillion uh, device connected to the internet, because it means about a couple of hundred per person. Two, three hundred device. Per person. Uh, they monitor you. They are not able to get this information, which is very like the government, uh, or it will be very different. And I guess we have to sort of stop preparing for those devices to be. So, and reaching the human rights rather than the other way around. I, I've got a beach house, you know, with no 3G and there's no internet devices. You know, you can come over, we can hang there and fish, you know what I mean? And nobody you know we're fishing, how, how many fish we caught, the size of the fish, you know, the speed of the fish, when we caught it, nobody would ever know. So, we can hang there. But outside of that beach house, it has a scary thought, right? It's a really scary thought. Yeah, who asked you to invent the internet, man? Look what you've done, bro. Stop it. <laughs> So what I hope to do is that a lot of collaboration between the people who free up the internet, the people who invent the internet, and the people who invest in the internet for all different forces in the market to rally together. And I don't know if there's actually a platform where all these different industries come together to speak about it. The technologists, the market, the technology forces, market forces, and political forces. Actually, I don't know. You know, maybe maybe you're the chairperson of one of them, but you know, I invite myself to one of these. But it'll be interesting to think, right? Like these three forces just sit down and talk about, like, okay, you know, can we just start talking to one another and plan this shit out, right? To, instead of kind of like randomly bumping at each other at conferences and see when <laughs> something will happen. Which three forces? Uh, forces of technology, people who just invent stuff uh, or build stuff, uh, or market forces of what people want to invent, also what people want to invest in, the inventors, the investors, and the institutions. They don't have an eye word for it. But the, the people who write laws who, uh, who set the political agenda for these things to happen. 
And I think if we put those three things together, it will decide whether or not each of our countries that we're in, whether or not we're going to have 50 companies or 100 companies that lead the future, or we're going to just wait for Silicon Valley and Bangalore and uh, China to do it for us. Um, and whoever does it, that's fine. Humanity is going to benefit anyway, you know, but I think that's uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully some of us rise up and uh, see all of this as an opportunity. Well, thank you so much for bearing with us. I know there's um, 12, 12 of you. Hey, yeah, you, you right there, wake up. Yep. Um, the, <laughs> and some of you have been uh, very engaged, so I really appreciate the quality of conversation and the comments. Um, so thank you, Hilam, as well, for uh, you know, preparing with me during lunch and uh, sharing all these ideas. I, I, I have a lot to think about, man. Yeah. Is there anything else? Uh, anybody can make a comment or question? Otherwise, uh, we may uh, close down. <laughs> He's gonna shut off the internet right now. <laughs> He's like, if you ask me a question, you're gonna turn it off. <laughs> so I think what I find really interesting is I think we're in a situation where um, we can see economic power actually shifting towards this side of the world, which is uh, exciting and scary at the same time, especially coming from a place where through war and death we learn a lot of about uh, uh, rights and uh, looking at how that could go, go right or wrong for this region just to, to see how uh, we can take and we continue to, to walk in the right way for humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the comments. Very inspiring. That's one great way to close this uh, panel. Uh, I can be contactable at, at Kylie on Twitter. It's the fastest way to get me. So it's like, Elias K H A I L E E. Just tweet me. I'll be right back. You know, and let's uh, keep this conversation going. Uh, I'll catch up with some of you other panels. Yeah, that's sort of closing the remark. But you mentioned okay, but like uh, uh, internet users population. Okay, it's all everything is stored in the USA, but today internet population central university here in Asia. I mean, it's, it's, it's inevitable because we are about four or five billion out of seven billion people. Then, uh, in that industry, it sort of seems to be inevitable. Some of the USA, still don't know about USA, but coming to the this time. So, it will be a halfway between the USA and the Asia. The reason is very simple. China will become a number one economy, and the India will be a number two or number three in a couple of years. Then uh, all those uh, growth tend to be the digital economy or internet economy. So here will be the uh, uh, center of uh, internet economy here. And uh, so the, we have to, uh, we are sort of a center of universe, and we have to sort of uh, uh, behave accordingly, not just the uh, 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 behavioral and just a user. So, you guys help us keep it free, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks.